Welcome everybody. Um, uh, I'm very happy to see you all here. So welcome to this uh, public debate on uh, dig digitalization in Europe. Uh, my name is uh, Melis Kitsing. I'm head of uh, research at the Foresight Center, uh, which is uh, a new think tank by the Estonian Parliament in Estonia. And at Foresight Center, um, currently we're working on uh, three projects on productivity, uh, um, future of uh, work, and future of e governance and all of those issues in one way or another way are related to the digitalization. And obviously, digitalization is not something that is uh, relevant only in the context of our own work, but it's also uh, very relevant in the context of uh, uh, Europe. It's also very relevant in the context of, of the world. And in Europe, uh, we have a free movement of capital, we have free movement of uh, services, goods, and labor. And all those uh, issues, in one way or another, are related to the digitalization. And so it's, it's a crucial uh, to discuss how different digital ecosystems in uh, Europe can uh, uh, be integrated, uh, how, we, how we can work across borders, how data can flow across borders, and how it can benefit our economies and societies. So I have a very uh, um, distinguished panel here. Um, uh, we have a uh, French uh, Secretary of State, uh, Mr. Majubi, uh, for Digital Affairs, uh, Secretary of State for Digital Affairs, who has joined us. Uh, and he uh, used to serve as the chairman of the French Digital Council, uh, with whom we are hosting this public debate uh, before his appointment as the Secretary of State. So uh, welcome, welcome to Estonia. And uh, n uh, next to me is uh, Maria Eckeland, who is uh, member of French Digital Council. Uh, Maria has been an uh, entrepreneur, uh, venture capitalist, founder of Tafni, also a member of a uh, uh, number of uh, boards um, of uh, important French companies. And uh, uh, right here we have uh, Clark Persons, who is an uh, executive director of uh, Internet Economy Foundation. Even though Clark is a native of uh, Alabama, uh, US, <laughs> he actually has lived for the last 20 years in Berlin. Internet Economy Foundation is a Berlin-based uh, organization. Clark also has been involved in founding a number of uh, ventures uh, in Europe. Uh, um, uh, and he can obviously t talk more about that, and so he has a distinguished career in business, uh, as well as in uh, public advocacy uh, through the Internet Economy Foundation. And uh, uh, our last uh, um, uh, speaker here would be He's uh, Nele Leosk, uh, who's working uh, as external expert for uh, our Foresight Center, but she's also has been for the last five years PhD researcher at the European University Institute focusing on <coughs> e-governance and e-government issues. So, uh, and Nele also previously has worked at the Estonian uh, e-governance academy. So this is, this is the distinguished panel, and we can uh, start actually with uh, our, our, our sort of the questions, sort of the main question that we're trying to tackle in this panel is, uh, is Europe connected enough with its uh, digital ecosystems to deal with the future, uh, to deal with the future challenges? But before you sort of start addressing this question, I would like you to talk a little bit about, uh, and that applies specifically to uh, Marie, uh, who will speak first, and second to uh, Clark, I would like you to talk a little bit about your um, uh, organizations and uh, how they relate to the ecosystems in, in, in France and in Germany and also in, in, in Europe, digital ecosystems. And then you can discuss briefly uh, the question. I think I will give you about 10 minutes. So we'll start with Marie and then with Clark. Then we move to Nelle. And the last uh, word belongs to the minister. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Please. Yes, so thank you. So the um, interpretation of the French Digital Council is, um, is trying to reach the, the right balance between having the, um, a pool of experts coming from the civil society. So we have a three-third three within the council. One-third is coming from business backgrounds, both startups and uh, key corporates. Another third is coming from academic background. And the last one is more uh, civil society associations, etc. because this is the one institution in France where you actually wanna build a digital vision, not only 
on one specific field, but really more broadly on all the different uh, fields where digitalization happen and has an impact. So not only on business, which is usually think tanks are very business focused, uh, in France at least, but also on matters that touch profoundly, deeply the society like education or um, digital literacy for everybody and things like that. Um, the way it has been built is that it's a mixed public-private initiative. Uh, and so the uh, members have been um, nominated by the uh, President of the Republic, French President of the Republic, and is actually under the submission of uh, Mounir. Uh, well. <laughs> I give you the money, but you're independent. <laughs> no, 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 no. But he, he is, he's working with the government to establish the right composition of the, uh, of the uh, council. Uh, and the um, the uh, team that is working permanently is uh, so Ruben and Jan and uh, another Jan who's over there are actually paid by the state, but all the yeah. members are uh, you by you. By yeah, you. yeah. So it's thanks, Munir. <laughs> but, I don't decide uh, <laughs> but he doesn't decide anything, which is the beauty of the whole thing. And so all the members who are actually the one who are voting the reports and who are voting the opinions that are stated are independent. They're not paid at all by the public and they're doing it on their free time. And these are all the experts. So it's really this mix and they try to find the right balance between being independent and so being able to express things against the government as well and not only, uh, but also uh, to, to establish uh, an expertise and a vision at the government level as well. So it's a, it's a mix between building together a French vision for uh, digital policies uh, by having co-creation with the uh, private sector as well or civil sector as well. Yeah. So the way it works is that minister will ask the council and give them a project, a mission, we will work on it, give a report, or we could assign ourselves some topics if we believe they're important and they're not dealt with. So that's the, the way it works in France in general and to talk about how we interact with the European Commission. There's other um, think tanks or associations, um, uh, and but none are covering, as I was saying, such a broad spectrum, especially on the society side and education and all that. And when I have dealt with European Commission in general, what I find is that there's there's a lot of uh, appetite for the voice from startups because I'm also a member of another um, association which is called France Digital, which is really focusing on the startup ecosystem. They're joining forces between venture capitalists and entrepreneurs. And so whenever um, we go to Brussels and talk to European commissioners or uh, members there, they're eager to hear the voice of the startups. But what they say is that they don't see that much, that usually the digital vision is brought to them by either big US companies or incumbents. And the reason being, from what I see on the ground, is that basically the digital ecosystems are not as developed. And so all the startups and entrepreneurs that I know are mostly focused on building their business than are thinking in which type of framework and regulation should I evolve. They just don't have the time, they don't have the means, and the problem is that the uh, digital economy is so developed elsewhere that the regulation and the decision and the framework needs to be discussed now. And so uh, trying to establish and, and join forces in being able to discuss at the same level with our US counterparts on what should be done is actually super tough because we're late. And because our entrepreneurs and our all the different experts have less, um, uh, have less, they, they didn't spend as much time thinking about it. And we're not at the same level in terms of networks effects. Uh, we're not, there's no European companies that has a more, that, that has a market cap superior to $10 billion. 
right? There's, there's not as worldwide. They don't have that, that many businesses, et cetera, so we don't have the same view. So this is one of the reasons it's so important to build this European digital squad is to really try to join forces between us because as a solo country or even as a solo ecosystem, we, we're not going to go fast enough. So um, this is one of the things is that we all actually need to counterbalance the voice of people that are usually speaking up and speaking out and try to find the time and means to really build that voice. And the second thing is what we have seen as well is that when you discuss with European Commission, they're pretty open and alert on these topics actually. But when you go to members of the European Parliament, or when you go to local representative of the countries who are actually the one voting the different European laws, they're not at all at the same digital literacy level. And so what will be super important is that it's not only discussing with European Commission, it's also spreading the world to all the different European Parliament members who do not have that same level of understanding of the different digital challenges that the, both the economy and the society are facing. And also to do the link between all these different institutions and the local institutions. Because when we talk about harmonizing the different rules in Europe, if we have a single directive, a single, but after every local country adapts it, then it's just as doing nothing, right? So super important that not only things are dealt at the European level, but the countries just accept it as it is and don't try to adapt it. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, now I will give a word to Clark, uh, uh, that you can introduce uh, your organization uh, yeah. briefly and discuss how it relates to the digital ecosystem and also uh, uh, discuss uh, how you would respond to this question that we have uh, for this panel. Thank you. Super. Thank you, Melis, and uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, the team at uh, CNUM especially and, and all of the wonderful uh, Estonian hosts here for uh, this opportunity. Uh, it's really exciting to be a part of, uh, of um, being, see, being the change we want to see, as, as they say. Um, one word, too, uh, it's wonderful that all the heads of state are, are here today to talk about digital and, and the digital economy, but I think everyone has now figured out uh, we're not just talking about the digital economy, we're talking about the economy. Uh, we're talking about the future of Europe. Uh, we're talking about if you if you like Europe as an idea and a concept uh, and, and the social values that underpin it uh, and drive its economy, then you have to be talking about digital and the digital future because this is the future of Europe's economy. I can only say yes, yes, yes to, to the wonderful comments from uh, Marie, uh, essentially the same sort of birth story, if you will, for the Internet Economy Foundation. We're an uh, independent, uh, private think tank uh, foundation based in Berlin. We came together less than two years ago, so we're a bit of a startup ourselves, uh, when a lot of the founders and funders from the German uh, and uh, Swiss uh, European um, digital ecosystems came together to start having dialogues and speak to the political actors uh, in Berlin and Brussels, and they very quickly got the same message from the politicians. No one is speaking for you. What does the, inter what does the European Internet even want or need? Um, we get a lot of great suggestions from, from the major American players. They have policy teams, um, but what does Europe need? So this was why we were born, if you will, and, and we're pursuing the same mission uh, in Berlin to try and uh, foster this dialogue, um, bring expert opinions together, put out studies, um, uh, and especially uh, talk to the policymakers and decision makers and the public about uh, what we think needs to happen. Um, so uh, I can only answer yes to, to the question on the table, uh, uh, or rather no, excuse me, not yet, to the question on the table, are we connected enough? Obviously not. That's why we, we felt the need to put this organization uh, together and, and all immediately responded to the idea because we see that the ecosystems need to talk to each other and coordinate uh, their message and then sing with one voice uh, to Brussels and to the national governments uh, about what we think uh, needs to happen. If we're going to create a, a digital single market and a single capital market, uh, then we also need to try and create, if you will, a single mindset uh, among the European digital ecosystem uh, for what we think needs to happen. I'll quickly touch on maybe, I think, the three issues that we as the IEF have been focused on, uh, because uh, if you focus on 20, then you don't really get anything done. So we've really tried to, to drill down, uh, also talking very closely with the stakeholders um, 
from our market about what they think they need. Uh, you know, um, we talked, uh, we're talking a lot about um, uh, the big issue that's on the table right now about platforms, a big subject that's uh, potentially being regulated and, and, and a lot of nations and Brussels are looking at it. Uh, we obviously, we, we did a study on this recently and, and it's for us a big issue that we uh, look at it. We also, um, uh, we feel like not all platforms are created equal. We know this and there are issues we have to look at with uh, potential regulation or setting of rules, I say, rules of the road uh, for how Europe can grow its own flourishing platform ecosystem. It has to be said here, uh, the top 20 internet companies in the world, there's not a single European on the chart. Um, uh, also, we're not really in the game in terms of capital and finance. Um, European investors represent 1.8% of the cap table of the top 30 internet companies in the world. So we're off the chart there. Uh, Europeans have 1.4% of the board seats. Uh, of internet companies, top 30 in the world. So um, we have a great ecosystem here in Europe, but uh, in world terms, we're really, um, you know, in German they say an Absatzmarkt, where we're, <laughs> we're the consumers. Um, we are the rounding error, if you will, uh, for, all, for much of the internet economy. And so we really feel like if Europe's going to really get in the game, we have to do it together and not just as Germany or France or Estonia or Stockholm or London or, or, or Lisbon or other ecosystems. We really have to think pan-European in terms of the movement of talent, or the movement of capital, uh, and the movement of data. So I've already jumped into our second issue, which is finance. We really feel like we have to close the finance gap. We have to find ways to do that. We have to find ways. Um, you know, I've done some number crunching on how the gigantic US VC market uh, was born about 40 years ago because of, of a minor change in investment regulation uh, that allowed you to put a little more speculation in your portfolio. Uh, so there's about six trillion in the US pension fund market right now uh, invested uh, and only 0.77 percent of it flows into venture capital. So all of Silicon Valley as we know it, uh, all 48 billion from the US pension fund market is actually a tiny fraction uh, of the amount of money invested in the US uh, finance world. If Europe would do that we would close the gap. I mean it's, it's very simple. We have to find a way to mobilize all of the sleeping capital of Europe because uh, Europe is wealthy. Europe has pension funds, Europe has money invested. Unfortunately, most Europeans are putting their money in their savings account and not investing it in innovation. So that's a big issue for us is how to unleash innovation made in Europe with capital from Europe. It's, a, it's, a, it's really the key for us to, uh, to unlocking Europe's future. Uh, and then finally, a, a word as well because uh, Brussels has also laid down some regulations on telecoms. You can't have an internet economy without the internet. Uh, and you know, when I got to Europe 20 years ago, it was ahead of the U.S. with uh, 3G and GSM. Uh, you know, Europe was way ahead uh, in in terms of the mobile internet, um, and it's not necessarily way ahead anymore. Um, and we have 5G coming, which needs fiber as a backbone, and Europe can really lead here uh, and and create a whole new range of incredible innovative products. But we really have to, to do our homework here on getting uh, competition into this system uh, to really ensure that Europe is, um, is leading on the infrastructure front too. So that's uh, what we're about. And again, it's really uh, thrilling to be a part of uh, uh, the formation uh, of the digital squads. And I think um, you know, if we do our work well and involve our own ecosystems, um, then, then I think we can really speak with a really great unified voice for, for what Europe needs. Uh, thank you, Clark. And uh, now I would give a floor to uh, Nele Leosk, uh, who can um, discuss uh, the importance of digital ecosystems uh, from the perspective of uh, e-governance expert. Right, please. Yeah, I, I worked with different governments, but now that I've turned more to academia, I, I take the liberty to, to take a more philosophical approach, maybe, and, uh, and start maybe asking, like, what do we mean by this digital ecosystem? We hear a lot about uh, new ways of doing business, companies. I would perhaps say that this digital ecosystem is actually our life in, uh, in a digital way. And it in, involves all of us, uh, government, businesses, civil society, uh, people, and, and all spheres of life. From the very moment we are born in Estonia, we get our digital identity and we keep this until, until the end of our life and everything that we could do in between, we, would ha we could do in a way in this virtual uh, world. But um, 
the other aspect of this digital ecosystem that we have not discussed yet in this public is actually uh, the democracy side that was actually addressed by the ministers this uh, morning because usually we still focus on the service provision, either service by governments, uh, businesses, other people, but we forget that actually this digital governance or information society in, involves also the democracy side. And I am sorry to disappoint the minister and, and also you, but currently the digital single market does not touch upon this issue at all. They only talk about uh, service provision and then these building blocks to, uh, to be able to deliver these services. So this is definitely a side that we, we should talk more and, and put more focus on. But ultimately, for me, the digital ecosystem is about better life, like better life to, to, to everybody. And, uh, and here is a question, how do we reach this better life? And uh, I believe that we all agree that technology will not bring this better life. It could, but it may not. And in order to make use of these possibilities, we have to change quite a bit. And uh, having followed a little bit the conversation, especially during the Estonian presidency, um, I think we are not yet ready to let go. Uh, uh, this morning, again, we, we are discussing uh, how to situate these new uh, ways of doing business, a new economy, sharing economy to, the, to our societies. And, and, and it seems to me that we may not understand that also the way we have regulated our society before may not be applicable to these new disruptive technologies. And, uh, and I believe Estonia had a good example here of regulating ride sharing when uh, it did not try to situate this ride sharing in the strict taxi service provision, but, but took a completely different approach to, to regulating this uh, new way of, um, of economy. But uh, coming to the second half uh, and, and, uh, and answering whether we are ready, I would, of course, agree with everybody, we, we are not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and partly because all the member states have very different political systems, institutional systems, organizational processes and that we have to change, but also that was brought uh, up by Marie and, and, and my other colleagues that we actually understand it very differently in member states. So if we ask what is privacy or what is cybersecurity uh, or what is digital identity, we in different member states get very different answers uh, still now. And I don't know how many of you remember, I, I, I do in, in 1990s, Europe passed the digital signature directive and there was a hope that now we sign all documents digitally, we will have cross border, document sharing and, and we realized that we all understand it differently. For some it was a PDF signature, but for example for, Est for Estonians it meant actually identifying also a person digitally. So this is actually a good uh, <coughs> sphere. Uh, in 2014 we passed the EIDAS directive and, and we understand now that digital identifications means that there is an identification process behind it. So there, has, there have been some developments but they are still uh, uh, basing on, on different building blocks, whether it is identity, interoperability, data sharing, um, e-delivery, and, uh, and so on. And uh, to my last point, why we are not connected actually is related to readiness. That was also partly addressed, but in the concept or in the sphere of uh, political decision makers. Uh, European Commission recently has been trying to measure this evolution in digital societies in Europe and, and, the, and the digital economy uh, and the level we are. And the results that quite recently came from this uh, DESI index, as it's called, are quite shocking because these reveal a huge gap between European countries in terms of connectivity, skills, service provision, but also the use both by people and private, sec private sector. So 
Of course, not surprisingly, the leading countries in no uh, Northern Europe are, are far ahead from, uh, again, not surprisingly, Southern Europe. So to connect, can we talk about this pan-European connectivity if we are actually not ready? And, uh, and these gaps are not only uh, between the, the, the countries, when we look, for example, even the different aspects of this digital society, let's take Estonia, that is number one in public service provision, actually lacks behind in using these services. Uh, and, uh, and particularly so by private sector. So there is, there is a huge discrepancy in this level and, uh, and there is a lot governments can still do. So I would perhaps end by saying that, that it's time governments take even more stronger, even stronger position and, and it's definitely time to put digital on political agenda because until now, digital governance has not been a political issue, not at European level and, uh, and I would say also in member states, including even in Estonia, where it has been political only because of internet voting. But, but that's about it. So this is a time to change. And, and uh, this was partly also the, the message of, uh, of politicians this morning. <laughs> so this is from my side all for now. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Nella. And now I would give a uh, uh, floor to uh, French uh, Secretary of State for Digital Affairs, please. Well, thank you for all your uh, uh, talks and your comments. And uh, thank you also for the debate you had this morning. I will follow up on what I said this morning and follow up on what you just said, uh, the, both of you, uh, the, the three of you and your last comment. I said this morning that the transformation of Europe will have to happen with digital in mind and with digital at the core. And the transformation of digital will have to also be a political transformation with political values underlying the European values of how we want to change and transform this world. Emmanuel Macron, during the speech he made uh, in Greece and then at the Sorbonne uh, a few days ago, deeply uh, announced that the vision he had for Europe was a vision where digital had this strong um, this strong uh, importance. But let's be precise. And that was your question. What is inside? So this morning I put four pillars of these digital policies that are really important. And uh, now we'll take a uh, few minutes to go uh, in uh, each of them. In terms of economy and uh, innovation economy and startup economy, that's true that at the moment we've dedicated a lot of time at the European level to create the digital single market. And if we look at it today, we've achieved a lot, but there is a, a lot more to achieve. Uh, a lot, lot more to achieve. And the Estonian presidency has accelerated uh, the capacity of the uh, states to, to, to deliver more. But still, it's not enough. Um, in terms of merging or reuniting the forces of European countries to innovate together, create champions, uh, create uh, trans uh, countries within the Europe uh, research, uh, transforming this research, see this research into innovations. Uh, we don't have a lot of fantastic case of a research made in Germany, transformed uh, by a French uh, company and sell it through a partnership and a joint venture with another country within EU. But we have all the legal tool to do it. We have all the political uh, friendship and love uh, to do it, but we haven't done yet. Uh, so there's a subject on that. Uh, we can talk a lot about uh, regulation, we can talk a lot about innovation and how we should build this big f European fund for uh, innovation, uh, rupturist innovation. But we need people that want to do it. We need research institutions that want to do it. We need entrepreneurs that want to do it at the European level and see the European mar market, not just a, 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 an open market in terms of data, but also an, op an opportunity market made of competencies from uh, multiple uh, countries. So what we want to do at the French government level is to find some projects we can support 
in order to demonstrate this capacity of European countries to act together in terms of research, transforming them into value and selling them abroad, creating a positive European commercial balance, which is uh, quite critical at the, at the moment because our commercial balance, uh, especially because of France, <laughs> uh, is not at its best at the moment. Subject of uh, digitization of SMEs and and uh, old economy uh, 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 companies. Again, are we well organized to help each other uh, through this transformation? Not enough. Uh, not enough. And each country is doing its best to help its SMEs to uh, transform. We have a plan that we built within the Conseil National du Numérique uh, uh, two years ago when I was a president, and we gave this report to uh, the government, and now I am the government, so I will <laughs> put it in place. <laughs> which, is, uh, <laughs> which is another way to see this thing, because when I, we gave the report, you, you had the, all these dreams of everything possible now, and uh, you expect the money to be there at the moment, now you are responsible for the whole budget of everything else. And then it will take time, but no, only a few months, so it will happen. But it's not what we discuss, it's not what we debate at the European level. Where it's something we should debate, the transformation of our economy, the transformation of our SMEs, what is coming now for the transformation um, provoked by uh, artificial intelligence. We've just launched a mission in France that is the, the second part of the one launched last year and that would be the final one to have an official national vision on AI. Well... It's important that we are doing it. It's even important that we have we can have this discussion at the European level. And we are not yet, yet. Uh, because the new refoundation of Europe will uh, have at its core the idea that we need to uh, discuss and prepare together this transformation the, that are really important to, to us. That was just the economy. And we still have the three other pillars. And, and that was your point. Digital should have... Uh, multiple ministers or no ministers at all because all ministers should talk digital. And I said uh, recently at the Minister Council uh, uh, to the President that I hope that I will be the last uh, digital junior minister, uh, meaning that after me, all the other ministers will become their digital minister in their own field and, and, and do it. Because on the um, state transformation field, at the moment we have uh, on eGov, but State transformation is even more important than eGov. eGov is a way to transform, but there are multiple other ways that digital is transforming the way we do uh, uh, public action. Um, we are sharing on a bilateral basis. We have other platforms to exchange, for example, the uh, uh, open government partnership uh, at the international level. But, you know, OGP is open to nearly 70 countries. It's not the same thing when you discuss with 70 countries when you have your uh, sister country where you've already sharing a lot and, uh, and you're sure that you have a pack of value that is uh, your core value and where we could do even more. We are not doing enough and we should do more and we should share more. We, sure we should build more and our European institution should be more inclusive of this technology and the way to, uh, to it. So we talk a lot about it, but we are not uh, doing enough uh, on it. On inclusion, the inclusion politics or uh, inclusion public policies are maybe the least discussed uh, subject at the EU level, but we are now f uh, looking at the consequences. You just talked about the, the case of uh, Estonia, where the high speed coverage of the country has been good. The creation, the transformation, digital transformation of the state is at a high level. Everyone has an access to these digital uh, uh, procedures, but still a lot of people are not using it. Uh, we evaluate in France uh, from 20 to 30 percent the number of persons who don't or can't access that type of procedure because they just don't know how to use it or because it's too complicated to, to, to use it. The thinking about this inclusion of people that doesn't know how to use uh, the digital or needs help or public help to use it is still something that we are not working uh, uh, enough at the EU level that we started to work on at the French level only a few years ago because it was a, an old public policy we had when computers arrived. Then we believed that everybody 
knew how to use computer. But then there was a second level of everything becoming digital. And then we forget, we forgot that we had to accompany the people uh, on the subject. And then the subject of cyber uh, will become the, the, the next big thing is to develop a common vision and big pictures on this new interplay of actors that is no more a question of only cyber defense and that needs to be both economical, inclusive with the cyber agency. If all SMEs and people were protecting themselves enough, then we are protecting our countries and our uh, continent uh, from attacks from abroad. Meaning that having uh, inclusive and economical inclusive uh, cyber hygiene politics is a defense question. And that's new. That's new to think that, that's new to say that, and, and that's really uh, important. In digital, you can protect yourself and protect your country at the same time. It's not the same in the physical world. So we have to think of this subject uh, as well in a broader way. So that was just a few uh, elements I wanted to tackle on what we are thinking at, what uh, our president announced, what I expect the new uh, way we will build this Europe in the coming years will help us to, to tackle more the, these questions. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Um, now um, there is an opportunity if any of the panelists want to reflect what has been said by others. Is there any any willingness? Or, uh, uh, if, if not, then um, actually I, I could ask um, uh, one question, um, which is which relates to what Marie was, has been saying in this morning, and uh, Clark was also saying um, uh, um, in this panel. Um, uh, in your uh, list of sort of priorities, the number uh, one thing was uh, this concern about uh, platforms, right? That there is like a heavy U.S. dominance and, uh, um, and Europeans uh, are not able to compete with uh, U.S. platforms. So, uh, um, and you mentioned that it's important to do sort of regulatory changes. And my question is that uh, are those regulatory changes uh, sufficient? for sort of ensuring the competitiveness uh, of the EU uh, platforms? Uh, and are there also dangers that uh, if we would uh, take a regulatory action, um, maybe there could be some other platforms in the future emerging from Europe? Uh, for instance, Germany has a you know, very strong manufacturing uh, base, and uh, we're talking about the, internet, the industrial internet of things, uh, you know, industry 4.0. So maybe uh, European platforms will sort of have advantage in the in the next round, or uh, how how would you see that? And that's also a question to Marie. So yeah, uh, please. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I often say that you know we're not going to just regulate our way to having European platform champions. I think that's important sure. to say. Um, and we ourselves, when we put together our platform study, um, uh, experienced it uh, firsthand. You know there are a lot of great platforms already operating in Europe. Uh, and so it's very important when you jump in here with policy ideas to make sure that we don't um, um, hurt the potential for uh, the existing European platforms to compete. Uh, and as you also mentioned, you know, here comes IoT. Right now they say voice is the next platform. After that, obviously, the auto is the next platform, and there are many more to come. Um, and so it's important that when, when we start talking about policy, that we make sure that we um, don't have the law of unintended consequences somehow hurt us. I mean, one example I can point out is right now the, the current e-privacy regulation. We're really running around trying to ring the alarm bell for everyone because um, uh, it's began as a, as a small addendum to the GDPR, the, the new data protection rule that will come in May. Um, but its scope is actually so gigantic that it could already hurt uh, the future platforms of Europe in IoT, machine to machine, and other things. So it's very important that when we start uh, start having people in Brussels write regulations, um, that uh, that they don't overshoot or that they make sure that they're um, really trying to be specific uh, as to what they're doing. And and we're actually discussing that already in in the digital squads ourselves. Um, you know, how do we want to define scope? This is really really important that we. Um, try to come up with some rules of the road. We even are trying to think of ways we can potentially help uh, introduce maybe some, some elements where uh, the ecosystem can think outside the box, not just the regulators, but maybe the ecosystem itself can start to do some governance or some ways to arbitrate. So I think there's a lot of really fresh ideas we can bring in 
uh, to the discussions here uh, on the platform issue. But, um, you know, right now, I think a lot of people in Brussels, when you say platforms, they just think of the big mm -hmm. four from the U.S. Um, and, um, you know, for the most part, they got where they are, A, because they could scale quickly, but because they had great products that most all of us use every day. So it's really important to, to not see, you know, the platform economy, if you will, as something that's evil per se or, or, or even monopolistic. It is, uh, you know, all of these companies are in business to maximize their market share and get the most customers. And, and through the network effect, you just very quickly move into potentially market dominant positions because that's your goal when you're building these ecosystems. So yes, we need to try and come up with some, mm -hmm. some rules of the road, if you will, but we have to really be very careful that we don't overshoot and hurt the potential for Europe to build its own ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I totally agree. It's it's uh, necessary, but not sufficient at all. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you want to create champions, basically, you also need entrepreneurs who hire the right talents, who have the right amount of capital and who go for it. And today, if you look at Europe in general, and I'll just say number for France, the average age of our 40 biggest companies is 105 years old. OK, so we have lost the past to growth in Europe, our, our policies, economical policies in the last 40 years, 50 years, was really focused on maintaining our champions, but not on creating new ones. So our entrepreneurship policy in Europe is not good. And we uh, have a lot of things to do to bring it back on track. So to start with, there's education, of course. I mean, we have not that entrepreneurial culture in Europe. Uh, we don't have the right role models anymore because obviously when your company is 105 years old, the founders are not at the head anymore. Yeah, so <laughs> so it's, there's really something about bringing back that spirit. There's also something which is considering that the talents we have in Europe mostly are managers. And being a manager is very different from being a hyper growth, um, a hyper growth uh, leader. Right, And so all the middle management talents who know how to bring a company from 100 million euros to 10 billion euros revenue, we don't have them in Europe. So being able to attract these type of managers, these type of talents in Europe is key. Because they, there's some knowledge elsewhere that we don't have. There's some experience that we don't have. If we want to accelerate that learning curve, then we'll need to import these talents as well. Because founders are very different characters, usually their stick there, but they need to have some executive with them who knows how to operate and, and build scale as well. It's not only about being visionary. And this we don't have in Europe. And the last thing is capital. And so the capital today, same thing going back to France, like 92% of the SMEs are financed through, ban through debt, right? Through, through bank loans. And when you're financed through debt, basically you want to be profitable. You're not investing in innovation. You're not investing in growth. You're not investing in going abroad. You're focused on, I need to pay back my debt, on being profitable. And that's a very different mind mindset and than uh, people who want to really tackle the world, go international. If you look at all these US companies, like they're losing billions of dollars or millions of dollars, 100 millions of dollars, because they're financed through equity. So going back to model a financial model where the economy is financed through equity is key. And today, as you were saying, Europe is wealthy. There's a lot of money, except the money is not going to the economy. So building that back on track through tax, and even the tax incentive are not built in a way that it drives every European citizen in saying you're incentivized in more supporting the economy and investing in the future of your uh, jobs, but in just other different type of financial services. There's a need of saying money has actually a purpose. Money is just not here to make money. It's here to make things, and it's here to make our, company, our society sustainable, our economy sustainable. 
So there's a lot of different things to do, if not only about regulation, but education, meaning that we need to be able to have not only digital literacy, but people having a creative mind, ha having a risk, a risk aversion culture that is a lot, a lot less than what it is today, people being really risk friendly and understanding that role models are people who are audacious and who want to build the future and uh, having also a uh, strong immigration policy to be able to attract all the talents that we're missing in Europe to make this company thrive and become billion dollars companies or tens of billion dollar companies. And the last thing is a strong financial policy to go back to an equity, fi an equity based finance companies. They need to finance their growth. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Clark and Mary. Uh, does uh, any, any of the other panelists want to add on anything on that? No. Then I will open it up for questions from the audience. So uh, any questions from the audience uh, who wants to ask something? Oh, yeah. yeah. I see a hand there. And we have also a mic. So please use uh, use a mic. So, yeah. And please also introduce yourself. Yeah. yeah sure. I'm Christian. Uh, I'm a student in uh, Estonian Business School, Digital Society, MBA. And my question is actually that uh, maybe why the money is staying in the pockets in Europe. Maybe it's because of that, that people don't trust the digital society so much yet. Because people don't trust it? Don't trust, yeah. Because they put s their money somewhere in the startup, mm -hmm. but they don't really trust the digital society. So I have uh, met in Estonia a lot of this uh, thinking that people don't trust uh, where the money goes and all the cryptocurrencies coming up and all this kind of stuff stuff so yeah mm -hmm. they don't really know where the money goes and what they do with that so maybe because of that thank you all right thank you uh, does anybody do you want to respond yeah, to I that can, Marie? Yeah, can, so more generally the money was not even before digital economy the money was not going to companies to enterprise so apart from, I understand the trust issue, but in general, in the European mindset, well, your money is savings. And investing in the economy is, investing, is different from savings. Whereas it's actually, it's a problem of financial education because when you look at the um, performance, even just investing in public companies, you know, people do not invest in public companies, right? So, and it's less risky and it's existing companies, et cetera. You get better performance and you're more able to build your savings for retirement than you're, if you're only leaving your money in, in, and giving it to banks to manage it to a different type of asset manager. So in general, we have a cultural um, mindset of not putting the money at work for companies, which is for me something that we really need to work on. But then to come back to your point, which for me is also important, which is to say, if we want part of that money to go to digital economy, we need to be able to build trust. And that goes back to this is why we need to have a regulation that shows transparency, that shows that there are some rules, actually, and that the digital economy is not just um, cowboy zone, basically. Add just a note to that too. Um, it's a it's a it's a great point. It's something you know. I've been in Germany 20 years, and so the contrast um, is quite striking. When the the, the so-called dot-com bubble happened uh, before your time, but uh, during mine, when I was an entrepreneur, um, that was actually the first moment, unfortunately, where Germans thought about investing in equity and stocks, um, and they rushed into the new market. We had a thing called the Neue Markt, um, and when the dot-com bubble burst. Uh, a whole sort of generation of first-time German investors said, well, that's enough of that whole equity game. I'm going to stick with my 1.5% uh, returns. So it, it's not just the digital uh, investment culture. It's, it's, a, it's a general social uh, aversion to investing in equities uh, in general. Um, but, you know, it's, it's very ironic because the money that is flowing right now um, through the European digital ecosystem um, well, there's a market failure, so Brussels is helping. The European Investment Bank and European Investment Fund uh, are actually behind a lot of uh, the investments you see, behind a lot of the venture funds. But, you know, obviously someone trusts this type of um, investment system because a lot of great sovereign wealth funds from outside of Europe are coming into Europe and putting the capital. This is why I pointed that figure out. Even the, a lot of the great European startups you know and love are financed with Asian and American 
uh, venture capital money because they obviously see an opportunity here. They see lower valuations here, but still good exits. So um, uh, the math is still really great to invest uh, in, in uh, private equity or venture capital. So uh, it is a, a major cultural change that needs to happen. And, and I know that in Brussels, they're talking about trying to create a new uh, pension funding system here at a pan-European level. So there's some initiatives to get a single capital market going. But uh, it's just something that people in the digital space bump up against immediately because it's so frustrating even in Berlin. I hear it all the time. Uh, if you want a Series B, you know, the second funding round, you're having to usually go to the U.S. Um, because the, there just aren't enough venture capital companies there that can ride a ticket, so to speak, um, in the size that you need to compete with the Americans, which is why a lot of the great startups we know in Europe, Booking.com, uh, Trivago, two in the travel space, belong to uh, American companies. Um, you, you tend to just let yourself get acquired because you can't find somebody to give you $200 million to, to, to take on the world. So it's, it's a big problem. Uh, it's a cultural change that needs to happen. It's not just in the digital sphere. Maybe I would just uh, bring in a, a parallel from the, the public sphere that I believe that the trust can be built only via practice. So uh, there could be as many regulations and uh, as good. It will it will not bring this trust to people. And and we saw that, I think, very well and may take time also. Uh, we saw it very well with Internet voting. Mm. In 2005, I think only 1.8 people voted. And, and, and by time, by now, it's this uh, number has grown considerably because meanwhile nothing happened and, and people built this trust in these institutions who were pro providing that service. So I believe this can be built only via practice. So. Sure. I mean, obviously trust is uh, important in multiple levels in public governance, in uh, investing, also in you know, trading across borders, uh, you know, using e-commerce. Uh, to do, do we trust uh, websites, you know, for, of, uh, of other countries? Do we trust to buy from that? So all those questions are uh, related. Or we, or we only do we only trust sort of dominant platforms, you know, you know like Amazon, <laughs> Amazon, and others? So. <laughs> but uh, are there any <laughs> are there any other questions that uh, people uh, want to ask? Uh, so, uh, um, yeah, sure. Yeah, and there are, I see some other hands as well. Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, yeah. I, I just want to add that. Uh, through the digital society and through the digital pages and platforms, actually, like, let's take U Uber and Taxify, you really, like, you really know much more who's your driver, what, what, what car he uses and everything else. So, actually, it's more trustful than the regular taxi. So, maybe uh, it can be changed somehow that way. Thank you. Hello, my name is Taranika. I am an EBS student, a uh, master's program, Digital Society. I'm from America. Um, Nele, Nele, you mentioned a lot about the public perspective. Um, and my thought, my question to you and the panel would be, uh, what are your solutions for uh, clarifying basic digital language uh, to inform across border because you have so many different languages in the EU and so many different cultures. How are your think tanks and uh, governments tackling uh, creating a single language almost that everyone can, a single, a single digital language that everybody can understand? I believe when it comes to service provision, getting information, there is no need for a common language as as we know English or Estonian or or French or, or, or Portuguese. I believe the machines deal with this for us. So what this uh, cross-border or this pan-European service provision, for example, should look like is that I could apply for a service no matter where I am, but using perhaps the services and infrastructure of the other countries. So in that in that point of view, I, I, do, I don't see the language being, uh, uh, being a barrier because this language issue is solved uh, in other ways. It's more in algorithmic. The basic, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Very briefly. I'm sorry. I'll clarify. Uh, I mean, uh, the digital language itself, you guys talked about uh, people not understanding uh, digitalization the same 
sure. across different oh, countries. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm talking about. How can mm -hmm. you define mm -hmm. digitalization? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it basically means these differences set across, for example, understanding the digital identity in, in different countries and how to, how to, mer uh, how to merge it. Uh, I, I believe that it's just uh, a lot of um, local level work that has to be done by national polit politicians and, and, uh, and national governments because people usually do not communicate with European institutions or, or if they do, it's, it's very rare. So here I, I see more of the clarification work of the national governments that have to uh, be stronger in, uh, in this regard. Maybe to add, as, as an American too, uh, great to have you here. Uh, um, uh, there are a, a lot of interesting cases right now about how the fact that you, if you're living in Germany, you could be buying from a French e-commerce site, but you're not. Um, uh, because it's not necessarily, you know, at the consumer side, there's just still some, let's say, cultural kind of comfort issues. It's not really a mistrust. It's just much more comfortable often to to work in your language, et cetera. But I think Europe has a lot of great success stories um, where it was able to get some very simple principles um, implemented across Europe that everyone understood. I mean, everyone now knows what the word roaming means. Um, and it was a very simple thing. I mean, there's a lot of triumphs in the telecom deregulation market that, that digitally we can look to for examples um, about things like, you know, we're now trying to define what do we mean by data portability what does Facebook have to give me back when I demand all of my photos and posts and links and everything back? How's that coming? So even, you know, even terms like data portability have not been defined very well. But I think if we do a good job uh, across Europe of uh, defining these really simple principles for what does number portability mean? Well, when I change from Vodafone to Telecom, I take my number. I, I think every European could probably tell you that uh, in one sentence. Um, there's still a bit of education that has to happen, but I think uh, Europe will really work best when it can find ways to take these complex issues and turn them into really simple principles that everyone can understand in the realm of how the, um, the digital sphere should work. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, please. Hi, uh, my name is Johanna Wellisto. I'm from Estonian uh, Foresight Center. Uh, so when I was listening to your um, uh, presentations, I was hearing a lot of comparisons with US. And at the same time, I started to uh, think about the uh, specific conditions in the US that have uh, created this uh, favorable ecosystem for digital um, uh, di um, this, uh, platforms that have been extremely successful. And actually, when we think about it, we see that there are these regions where the uh, unicorns, unicorns emerge from, and these are smaller specific areas. So I have actually this intriguing question. Um, do we have to aim for this um, uh, digital uniform high level all across Europe? Or could we aim also for this highly attractive regions, cities, and could the rest of the Europe benefit from that? Thank you. Yeah, please, Marie. Yeah. Yeah. So for, for looking at companies grow, um, as a, I'm a venture capitalist, so I saw companies grow if either from Europe and from the US. The main difference that you have when you build a startup, if you start from Europe or if you start from the US, is that in Europe, you have, if you want to reach critical mass, you cannot reach it on your local market. And so you need to go at the international level super quickly. And that's the, the main difference. But I agree with you that you, the, the, it's actually a hub. When you, when you talk about US startups, basically there's San Francisco and the Silicon Valley, there's New York now, and there's LA who's starting up. Boston for biotech. But when, when I say I have a network in the U.S., I basically have a network in San Francisco and New York. Right? You, it's, a, it's an economy where you need hubs. And actually, the interesting thing is when we talk about ecosystem, that's because this is the way it works. It's, we have one first success, and the U.S. PayPal was super important in how to build Silicon Valley because the founders of PayPal were Elon Musk, who built Tesla and, uh, 
And uh, SpaceX afterwards, you have Reid Hoffman, who built LinkedIn, who became a partner at Greylock, which is a very big venture. You have the founder of YouTube, who was an ex-PayPal as well. You have Peter Thiel, who was the first investor in Facebook, who's sitting at the board of Stanford. You have all these people, you know, who afterwards had the career, and you have this growing at the ecosystem level of bigger and bigger. So this is a virtuous thing, but in terms of addressable market, we, have don't, we don't have what they have. So I agree that we need to focus, and if you look at different European ecosystem and their maturity, actually the, uh, this is why I'm talking about the fact that we're lacking these talents who know how to grow very big companies because this is really accelerating the path to US startups, right? To have these people onboarding when you start growing because you're benefiting from their experience, you're benefiting from their network, you're benefiting from all this. And it's, a, it's the ecosystem um, lever, basically, and the experience lever. So we're doing that at the European level. Some ecosystems are more mature than others, but we all tackle the same issue that we will never reach critical mass on our local markets. and the US, you can. So it's both ways. We need to have harmonized market, both for capital and for spreading your solution and services. But we also need to have very strong ecosystem where talents can go together. And if we manage to build links between ecosystems, which has not been done in the US very much, then maybe there's something else to, to, to bring on the table. But that has never been done. point to that too because I, I hear it all the time. I used to work in economic development. Actually, my first job in Berlin was trying to convince Silicon Valley companies to come to Germany. So this whole notion of can we be the next Silicon Valley is it's, uh, quite ridiculous. There's, there's really only one, uh, you know, and, and Boston and LA also would like to be Silicon Valley too. They have great clusters though uh, because if you can get a cluster where you have a quick access to talent and capital, that's, you know, that's already two pieces of the equation. Um, Marie made a great point about U.S. companies all immediately have scale because of the language, and, and you can go all over the U.S. from one city in the U.S. That's also an advantage the Chinese have. They instantly have scale, too, when they start. But I think Europe has a chance to build, you know, the federation of clusters, everyone doing what they do best, but uh, linking to the rest in a quick way. And Germany itself is a federation of clusters, so we, we live that every day. I mean, Germany, uh, the regions compete, uh, and each of the cities and states uh, has the thing that they do really well, uh, and they focus on it, and I think Europe has a great chance to do that. We already see some emergence of that. I mean, look to the Nordics, look at the gaming industry in Helsinki. Uh, you know, look at, um, uh, you know, Europe leads in music and gaming uh, worldwide. Uh, in the digital industry. Uh, look at all of the things that are going to happen out of Germany with IoT, uh, the industrial internet of things, telematics. I mean, Germany has some great strengths that they can hopefully build on. So um, FinTech in London, they lead the world now, unfortunately leaving the EU possibly, but, um, but they made a concerted effort to say we want to lead the world in FinTech. Uh, and so one final point, because I, I learned this when I ran a business school for the creative industries. Um, you can be world class from anywhere. Uh, the, one of the greatest ad agencies in the world, Forsman and Bodenfors, uh, is sitting in the second biggest city in Sweden. There's nothing there but the greatest ad agency in the world. Um, if you want to be world class uh, and hold yourself to that level and do things uh, at the global level, you can. Um, in Europe, we need better access uh, to, to scale the market quickly, but there's no reason that a company from Estonia or Berlin or Lisbon can't be the world leader in something. Uh, if they set themselves that goal and, and work to the world market and, and raise their ambition. Okay, uh, last question, please. Yeah, please. Okay, okay. Uh, my name is Hakan Berber, and uh, I'm a PhD student in Tel University of Technology. And we are here. We uh, we are talking about the future of European Union, right? In terms of digi digitalization, and. I believe that like the best, like better future comes with the better research and development, right, in the universities. And Clark also compared United States to European Union, and the biggest share uh, and leading country is the United States, right? And also, if we consider that the top universities and like the United States universities are dominating top hundred, right, in the world, and while considering these facts, do you? plan to increase the share of investment in research and development and 
how would you plan to get this biggest share out of United States leading co uh, companies in digitalization, in ICT, or artificial intelligence, and uh, in these topics, I mean? Who, who, who wants to respond? Uh, Clark, you want to respond? Think, yeah, uh, a brief, I, I brief wanna, response, I'll, I'll yeah. Really quick, uh, but yeah, sure. I want to give others a chance. This is a great subject, and Munir brought it up, connecting the innovation that's at the university level to the capital. I think a lot of the U.S. universities, you know, decades ago at MIT and Stanford found ways to let the professors uh, and the capital nearby um, join forces, uh, and I think Europe has to catch up a lot on that. There's even intellectual property issues often. I know the people at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, which uh, has given us a lot of really great um, uh, internet and tech products. You know, those people are often having to sign away some intellectual property when they go to the school. Um, so there's things we can do to try and tweak that, but it's, it's a key. It's connecting, you know, the great minds are here. Europe has more programmers than the U.S. There's great research centers here. Uh, Amazon, you know, has put its AI research center in Berlin. Facebook put its in Paris. The AI specialists are in Europe. Um, so we just have to find a way to connect these brains to the capital. I think that's just a really key element of, of Europe's future. Yeah. Would anybody like to add to this or no? All right. Okay. Nella, I brief, would, uh, brief comment. just uh, briefly add having experienced both from American academia and European academia, that uh, how we uh, see entrepreneurship in, in Europe is in academia is still not as, as they see it in the US. Here, real academic deals with thinking uh, and, uh, and uh, analyzing the processes that are happening in a society and, and everything new or practical is a little bit like second order. So this may also be one of the reasons why European universities have not been as good providing an extra value, actually, uh, into a society than American schools have been until now. But, but this is also changing, so we'll see. Because there are also some new uh, centers in merging in Europe that, that deal with how to uh, add something to a society. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry we cannot take more questions because uh, we have a, another appointment at 11. Um, but um, today uh, we launched uh, a new initiative. Uh, it's an initiative of four countries, uh, five think tanks. Uh, uh, we have a foresight center from Estonia, French Digital Council, IRATS, IRATS Lab from Germany, also Internet Economy Foundation from Germany, and uh, Commerzkollegium from Sweden. And uh, we, de we decided to work together uh, to find ways how and to propose uh, possible solutions on a European level, how we can increase uh, digitalization. And uh, I would like to ask uh, Marie, maybe you want to say a few words about our, uh, the, uh, you know, the key messages from our workshop this morning. Uh, so just to wrap it up, uh, we had a brief uh, workshop before this public panel. Yeah, please. Sure, so to, to come back to actually one of your topics, which were how do you find common grounds? I think we, uh, the way when when discussing, because we believe the, um, as you were saying, also digital economy is actually the economy, and it's an economy where players, economical players, tend to become platforms, and where you have different type of relationships between both end customers, middle players, which are service providers on top of platforms and platform themselves. And so the first thing we said that before understanding what type of fair and incentivized regulation we could put in place, well, we had to agree on what how to design these relationships, what type of principles we think they should have between them, and then afterwards what type of modern regulation we put in place because obviously digital economy is decentralized a lot more and it, there's uh, some intelligence in the crowd. Could we put some type of different um, regulation, not centralized, but also a way of articulating centralized regulation with whistleblowing coming from either consumers or um, business partners or things like that? And so the whole idea was to say, how could we first start with the common ground of defining what are the different a type of players in that economy, what are the different type of relationships they have, what type of principles we think they, in their relationship they should establish, and what could be uh, an efficient way of monitoring this while still maintaining an environment that is very favorable to innovation growth, but maintaining fair rules and trust. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank you all for coming. Uh, um, um, and I also would like to thank you, uh, our distinguished uh, panelists, very much. And I would like to give you a small gift. It's ah. about uh, uh, e-governance in <laughs> practice in Estonia. Uh, I hope you will read it. Oh. And uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. We'll have so, the same so, one for yeah, France. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank